everybody. This is Joel Hoekstra of Whitesnake, and you're listening to Backstage Access, where the real show begins. Hi, this is Chris with Backstage Access, and today we have none other than Joel Hoekstra from Whitesnake here with us today. Welcome, Joel. Well, thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. Hey. Thank you for taking the time. Appreciate it very much. So White Snake has this great new record that's coming out in May, Flesh and Blood. Tell us a little bit about what we can expect from the album. Uh, I think there's an influence from just about every era of White Snake, kind of stretched across the the bonus edition. Cool. A couple of the couple of the, the bonus tracks are maybe the bluesier uh, songs, but I think that. People that are thinking after going shut up and kiss me that it's um, going to be a slip of the tongue kind of revisited. Uh, I haven't given the whole album a shot yet because they'll be surprised. There's there's a little influence from every era of White Snake, in my opinion. Awesome. Now this is the first album of all original songs since you joined the band. So Correct. tell us a little bit about how the songwriting process went and what your involvement was with all of that. Well, initially, when David had called me out to kind of work on Unzip, what became Unzipped, okay. uh, Mr. Cox said, uh, we worked on After All together. We had the A section for the song and said, where would you go with it? And I kind of gave him the suggestion of the B section chords and wrote the intro in the middle section. So we put that song together uh, long before Flesh and Blood happened. It wasn't even intended for Flesh and Blood. Uh, it just so happened that everybody liked the song so much that it got voted onto the album. Uh, and at the same time, during that stay, I think we were just kind of acoustic out at a point. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, I picked up an electric, and we basically came up with the, the riffs for Trouble Is Your Middle Name. Um, so that gave me a jump start on writing with David before I knew we were really writing for an album. We were just writing for fun. Right. Just we didn't know for what. It was just for kicks. And obviously any any involvement of, with that with David is a fantastic thing and an honor as far as I'm concerned. Sure. Uh, and like I said, I got a little jump start there. And then Reb was out and he had some ideas, some pre-existing ideas, and so did I. But it usually kind of works out that David will have the initial spark for a song, the initial idea, and then Reb, either both of us, Reb and I, or one of us would help David kind of complete those ideas. Uh, and then some of them, David, it's just David on the on the record. So it's, it's a balance between all of us, and Reb and I work great together, and working with David is really easy, too. He's very quick. Uh, he likes things that hit him impulsively, and he, he, he likes to keep things simple. He's not, uh, he doesn't want to overwrite things and make things too complicated. So okay. uh, that's a good thing. I think yeah. he's, from years of experience, he's learned to follow his instinct and, and know what a good song is. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned that, you know, you and Rem work well together. So how does that kind of whole thing work when you're in the writing and recording process? Who plays what? Where am I going to put this? How do you guys kind of hash that out? Uh, well, I, I think that it's it's unique with each scenario. Okay. Uh, the way it worked out with this is that Reb was out there. I did help or work on him with a couple of his ideas that we presented to David. And David likes to demo everything still before you record it. So okay. uh, he's old school in that manner. A lot of people have totally done away with that these days. But he likes to basically record the songs, see which ones he likes, and then record them again. Uh, and then there, there might be elements from the demo that will keep or fly in. But for the most part, you, you're tracking um, with, a, with a clean slate once you decide on the songs. Uh, but in terms of like who plays what part, if the person who wrote the song, they uh, – that's not good English. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so I'm looking for if you wrote the song, you probably came up with a foundation for the part. Right. So in most cases, I like to double what Rev would play to have the Les Paul sound going throughout and then kind of come up with any overdub ideas. And both of us, 
for the most part, like to keep it simple. Uh, occasionally, I go a little further with the overdubs than, than Rev does. Uh, Rev likes the two-guitar Aerosmith sound, and I'm probably a little more from the school of having maybe three or four parts on a song at times. Okay. Uh, uh, gosh, from their solos, I just kind of tell Rev, take whatever you want, dude. And I, I'm not very competitive in that department. I'm happy to play over anything. Uh, I think it's all music in the end. Rev is a little more, I guess, what's the word I'm looking for? Discerning in terms of like taste and what sections he likes and that he wants to play over. Okay. I kind of just view it all as one big thing and just like, I'll, I'm happy to play over any of it. It's all, all works for me. It's all about that goal of making it as good as it can be absolutely and, and also just being a good bandmate in the end i i i just always think like people that go that go for that in a two guitar situation that try and grab everything it's it's not really conducive to a happy band i think in the end so uh i, I want to make sure that rev is happy and having a good time too so just as much as i want to make sure i'm happy so cool. uh we, we, we've worked together really seamlessly in that department we haven't had any issues over i really want to take that solo that kind of thing awesome awesome now i like how you described it as saying that the album kind of had a little bit from all the eras of white snake because that's what i kind of felt it had such a great variety on it thank you you know like you said the, the bluesy and then like you said trouble is your middle name is more like that harder rock and i did um i really like when i think of you color me blue because that goes back more kind of i thought to my my 80s era of uh yeah, music that sounds like a real 80s david coverdale ballad yes 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 have to love that one um but it's all excellent so you guys also had the video out already for shut up and kiss me so and that too has that little throwback feel to it from the old white snake videos so what kind of goes into the whole video process does david have an idea or do you guys have a team you kind of um lean on for that it's for the most part that's david and tyler morns okay does all the video stuff right now that's become he's become david's in-house guy more or less out there and david is great about asking opinions and shooting things past us and occasionally and i'll say something or have a little bit of input but basically that's that's all cool now you guys are going to be kicking off a tour pretty soon uh, is it an extensive one how long you guys plan on being out for so right now we're looking at starting up rehearsals april 1st and then the u.s tour starts april 12th and runs through i believe may 18 currently okay and then we have a little break and we're going to go to europe and i believe that is something like june 12th through july boy 19 something like that okay everybody can check the dates on white sure Day. sure yeah and will we be hearing a pretty good selection of songs from the new album in the set list you think I've, you know, I don't want to give away our set list before we get out there and play it. Right. I will say that in past history, David likes to represent some of the new material live, absolutely. So I think I, I can safely say people are going to hear some, some new stuff. Cool. Now, I always love seeing you play, whether it's uh, White Snake, Trans Siberian Orchestra, if you're out with Cher, because you always seem to just genuinely enjoy yourself on stage and put on just an amazing performance for everybody, whether they're in the front row or in the very back of the venue. So how important is it for you to kind of have that personal connection with the audience? Uh, I dig it. It's funny. I, I have a lot of anxiety and stage fright that kind of uh, somehow comes out in a, in a real comfortable way on stage, I guess, with smiling and enjoying, I guess. I guess that's my way of kind of coping with that, is to have okay. time with everybody. And you would never know it. <laughs> just, yeah, I, I know. It's, I get that from people all the time, that they, they think that's odd. But I'm usually really antsy before a show, really nervous. Uh, so I think it's part of my way of dealing with that, is just to like concentrate on having a good time with everybody, rather than thinking about, what if I screw up, or what if... <laughs> <laughs> what if I don't play well? Uh, all those mental cycles that can, I guess, drag you down. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I love it. I, I love what I get to do for a living. It 
it's I think on a, a very deep level. It's just kind of it's it's who I am. So uh, I feel blessed to have the opportunity, and that that's I think the biggest part is that I have a, sen- a sense of gratitude. It took me a really long time to have my career kind of open up. I worked really really hard and always with my guitar since basically since I was a teenager in terms of making a living and, and things finally kind of opened up for me in really my mid to late 30s where I was like, oh, wow, I'm doing pretty well with this all of a sudden. So I think that because it took me so long and I didn't sell millions of albums when I was 19 or 20 years old, right. <laughs> like some people, uh, it just gave me a deeper sense of gratitude for the whole thing. Awesome. Now, um, I did read that you grew up with a classical background um, and that your parents were classical musicians. Were they supportive of your transition to rock? Uh, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> I, I think that when I went to them saying I wanted to play guitar, they probably pictured Segovia. They didn't realize I, was, I wanted to be Angus Young. Gotcha. <laughs> but... It's, it all worked out. Uh, I think that they, there was times where, like any other parents, they probably thought, oh, man, like he's going to go and try and be a guitar player. <laughs> they want their kids to pick out something safe. Right. And my parents were no different in that department. I think that they, they wanted me to be in music, but they, when it came to the actual, like, that's how you're going to pay your bills, they probably thought, oh, man, you should really try and do something else. Well, I'm glad it all worked out. <laughs> yeah, and in the end, it all worked out. And I think nowadays that um, they 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 do uh, appreciate it. And it it reached a point where they see the the success, and uh, I think they just accept it for what it is. Although they don't entirely understand it. <laughs> well, they're both classical people, like through and through. Right. Now, you are super busy because you are doing always something you're always out on tour or recording with somebody but have you have any uh, updates to give us on your project joel holkster's 13 because it's been a while since we've heard anything uh yeah i i'm working on a follow-up okay and i thought as far as i've kind of gone with it with anybody is just saying that Vinny apice is on board again he he's done and tony franklin is done playing the bass on it and they sound killer together. Those guys are awesome. And all the all the songs are totally written. There's, uh, I think it's a stronger batch of songs this time around. Wow. Okay, that's saying a lot. Because I really love Dying to Live. Oh, uh, cool. Thank you. I think everybody will really dig it in the end. It's just, for me, I'd rather get the musicians I get on there and deal with their busy schedules. And right. Not Try to just try to rush something out to make money because honestly uh, I'm able to play with uh, different artists and tour with them to make the money and this is more about making an album like that isn't really about uh, paying my bills it's more about just my artistic outlet and making sure I'm really happy with everything awesome well we will look forward to that when it comes out as well cool thank you I appreciate that sure and what about the single that came out with Ian Ray Logan back in October How did that whole thing kind of come about for Just Follow Your Heart? Uh, Well, that was just somebody who contacted me about playing a guest solo for him, basically. Okay. I didn't really have have anything to do with it. Uh, That was his song, and I do that for lots of people. I'm I'm the type of guy that likes to help out people and uh, contribute to their song and, and obviously get paid to get better on my guitar. So if I can pick up a session laying down a guest solo for somebody as opposed to practicing scales that night. I'm down with the session. Absolutely. Understood. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I know that this White Snake album is going to be huge. We can't wait until it comes out so everyone can get a chance uh, to hear it. And we look forward to the tour because, as always, White Snake puts on one hell of a show, and it's absolutely fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. Kind words. I appreciate it.